In the distant past of old earth, there was a myth of the Holy Grail, the quest for which was equated with the desire to realize the eternal truth and the living essence of the higher worlds. The possessor of this truth would be transfixed in the knowledge of his own self and strive to bring good to all mankind. With the passage of time, the Grail-related mysteries became a thing of the past, but the passion for the search for eternal truth was transformed into something more. This character trait was characteristic of Magnus the Red, and it was because of it that he condemned his sons to damnation. Magnus the Red, also known during the early years of the Imperium as the Crimson King and the Red Cyclops, was unique among the Primarchs. All of the Emperor's sons were endowed with a psychic gift that manifested itself in different ways. Some had prophetic foresight, supernatural secrecy, or an aura of greatness unavailable to mere mortals. But of all his brothers, it was Magnus who had the most incredible psychic potential, as well as remembering his own creation. Even as his life was being born in the white-hot crucible of genius, he had talked with his father, had delved into his dreams, had contemplated the enormity of his plans, and had realized his place in them. Just as a mother speaks to the unborn child she carries in her womb, so the Empress spoke to Magnus long before he was born. But an unborn child knows nothing of the world around it, whereas Magnus already knew everything. He had a form of psychic connection to his father, which had functioned during the formative stages in the Emperor's gene laboratories on Terra. This suggested that Magnus the Red's psychic abilities had been deliberately enhanced by the Emperor. Even Magnus's appearance could be the result of the deep metaphysical imprint left on his soul. It is said that an ordinary mortal's eyes at first perceived him as separate images, the glowing skin as if the veins beneath it were filled with flame, the mighty wings of feathers and gold plates, the copper-red mane dishevelled and ashy and his face was a continuous flicker of light and flesh, as if beneath the skin and muscle lurked not bones, but something more dynamic and energetic. For a moment he seemed a giant, and then an ordinary man, and then a deity or a being with a million eyes. But then, as consciousness came to order, the mortal's eyes saw a warrior with copper-red skin. Over the warrior's shoulders fluttered a cloak of feathers, to which were attached sensors and wax-sealed parchments. Black curved ebonite horns protruded from his breastplate, and an identical pair rose behind his shoulders. From beneath his belt dangled a light-coloured tabard decorated with a blazing solar disc, and at his side a heavy book bound in thick red leather was fastened on golden chains. Such a perfect creature is marred by one flaw. The Primarch looks at the world with only this one eye. Where the other eye should have been, the skin shone smooth and even, as if the other eye socket had never existed. It is said that his unique horned armour was not only a tangible physical construct, but also a thing of concentrated psychic energy that changed shape and appearance at the Primarch's will. Such armour was resistant to the most destructive weapons, despite its primitive appearance. In his hands, Magnus carried the blade of Annunura, a power weapon. He also had a handgun of immense size, the Volkite Serpenta. Even among the Thousand Suns, there was an ongoing debate as to whether this powerful plasma weapon was a device or simply a manifestation of his psychic abilities in physical form. His home is the planet Prospero, which has long been inhabited by psychers capable of warp flows. They made this world home because of its inaccessibility, having been persecuted as sorcerers since the Dark Age of Technology. When the incubation capsule carrying the Primarch appeared in the skies, they mistook it for a giant intimidating comet that eventually fell into the central square of Tizka. The child found in the capsule soon became an apprentice to the psycho-scientists who ruled the planet and developed psi abilities similar to their own. Because community and quickly learned everything they could give him. He surpassed Prospero's most illustrious scientists within a year of his arrival on the planet, their beliefs were too straightforward and dogmatic for him. His intellect in every way surpassed the minds of those who tried to teach him. Even his initial training had yielded far more than they could give him. Soon the young man made a trek into Prospero's wastelands, 
true strength is given only to those who subject themselves to the most severe trials. Within the confines of the community, he knew no fears, no hunger, no special hardships, and therefore had no reason to test the limits of his abilities. It was necessary to test his strength to see if those limits even existed. Magnus believed that outside the city he could do it or perish. He travelled hundreds of miles on roads through ruined cities where the metal frames of tall towers, deserted plazas and vast amphitheatres still remained. Then he climbed a mountain and reached a bend where a long dead sculptor had erected a huge statue of a bird carved from multicoloured stone. It was a majestic figure with raised wings and a graceful swan's neck. The statue perched on the edge of the cliff and stood there for thousands of years, swaying and yet keeping its balance. But with Magnus's appearance, it tumbled down the cliff and shattered into thousands of coloured shards. For days, he studied the remains of the statue until he saw a pattern. The different sizes of the shards combined to form different geometric shapes. Magnus realised this and began to put them together. The longer he immersed himself in understanding the patterns, the more complex the shapes became. Magnus was discovered by Eamon, who had been his mentor in his younger days on Prospero. By then, young Magnus had already completed one grimoire and was beginning to fill out a second. The patterns created by the shards of stone carried information about the complex processes of the universe. Together with Eamon, they returned home and told the sages of Tizka about their discovery. They were great men, and their admiration for the beauty of nature helped them to penetrate the essence of the observations. They were so excited that they hastened to repeat Magnus's pilgrimage and reached the place where the statue had stood. The shards of stone lay as they were, and the Tizka's magisters began to fill in their grimoires. Some described triangular compositions, others dealt with circles, and some gave their full attention to the vast colour spectrum of the stones. Later, the scholar pilgrims were attacked by the Saiknuyin. Each group manifested a variety of powers with which they repelled the attack. That day, they were able to gain a deeper understanding of the gifts of the Great Ocean, and returning to Tizka, dispersed to their pyramids to reflect on their experiences. Thus were born the societies that would become the basis for the structure of the Legion of a Thousand Sons fraternities in the future. Rising as a leader, Magnus united the mage cults and set about rebuilding civilization. The capital city of Tizka was transformed into a city of breathtaking beauty. Beautifully designed, pyramid-shaped buildings and towers of glass and marble, wide boulevards, paradisiacal parks, and a constantly favourable mental background soon led to the bliss of the entire population. This period of peace, prosperity and mental well-being was reflected in the planet's population, and Prospero became known as a planet of physically and spiritually beautiful people. Cyclops also set out to unify and expand the Prosperian's knowledge of the Great Ocean. To achieve this goal, he built the Great Library in the center of the Pyramid of Tizka. And later, he discarded all warnings from his wise teacher, Eamon, about the dangers of delving too deeply into the Immaterium. And for the first time, did something that the other inhabitants of Prospero had not done. Instead of summoning the energy of the Great Ocean into the material world, Magnus stepped into the warp himself and explored its farthest reaches. Noticing the presence of such a powerful mind in the Immaterium, the Emperor sent the Great Crusade fleet to Prospero, and when he stepped onto the surface, Magnus greeted him like an old friend. Decades later, he recalled returning to the world of his birth with his father, how they travelled along forgotten paths and explored ancient secrets. The Emperor generously shared with him the secrets of the universe and his wisdom, not suspecting that his student would soon surpass his teacher. They roamed the red-hot deserts of Meganesia and travelled the invisible paths that the first people who inhabited these lands called Song Lines. In other worlds, these paths were called Lei or Lung Mei and denoted the lines along which the blood of the gods flowed, mysterious streams of energy. His father had told him that the shamans of ancient terror could touch these currents and draw power beyond the reach of other mortals. Many of them aspired to become gods themselves, to found an empire and enslave the rest of the population. 
The Emperor said that these people were using energy they did not understand and had brought terrible misery upon themselves and their peoples. Magnus listened attentively, but in his heart he longed to master these powers that were beyond the control of mere mortals. He was a creature of light, so far removed from human nature, that he could no longer think of humans as his forebears. Yes, he was far above them, but he tried not to forget evolution and the sacrifices made for his elevation. He considered it his duty and honourable obligation to hasten the ascent of those who would follow him and to show them the light as his father had done. In addition to the wisdom of the Emperor of Mankind, Magnus was given his own legion who inherited his psychic talents. But their gene seed proved unstable, leading to a horrifying affliction called flesh alteration. It manifested as horrific mutations, mental instability and organ rejection. Because of this, the Legion was greatly weakened and its survival was in great doubt. There were even rumours that by the time they met the Primarch, there were only a thousand Space Marines left in the Legion, which was why they were called the Thousand Sons. They were not allowed to join the Great Crusade when it began, and some in the young Imperium favoured the dissolution of the Tainted Legion and its physical extermination. But Magnus managed to convince the Emperor to give him a chance to find a way to defeat the out-of-control mutations. The Emperor of Mankind agreed, and after decades of inhuman effort, Magnus finally succeeded. He ventured into realms no being should tread, and acquired the Iron Lord forbidden knowledge from the Immaterium, halting the flesh change. Rumour has it that Magnus gave up his eye in exchange for this knowledge, but the Primarch himself never confirmed or denied these tales. After all, it was his favourite legend. Perhaps the chronicler who invented it was unwittingly referring to an ancient Terran myth about a Scandinavian god, Odin, who sacrificed an eye in exchange for a sip from the well of Mimir. Not a single Primarch remembered the face of Magnus with two eyes. The Crimson King granted his sons knowledge of mental states with which they could better control their emotions when using Psi powers. This tool was called the Enumerations. The higher the level of the Enumerations, the more spiritual purity was inherent in the Psyche, as the individual became more free from the corrupting demands of the ego. The tenth level of the Enumerations was labelled by Ahriman as the highest attainable. It is known, though, that Magnus knew much more than these practices. Mastering the enumerations allowed practitioners of the psychic arts to rise up the social hierarchy of Prospero's inhabitants. Not everyone advanced beyond a certain level, though. There was at least one member of Magnus's inner circle, Hathor Mart, who never achieved absolute mastery of enumerations. Cult of the Pavoni in general had particular difficulty with this because of their inherent vanity and self-centeredness. When word reached terror that the abnormal mutations had stopped, the Thousand Sons joined the Crusade. Magnus fought bravely in the Great Crusade, but he was drawn to the Great Ocean and the secrets hidden in its waves, which he sought out and devoured with great zeal. He made contact with long-isolated human cultures scattered in various corners of the galaxy, where the Psykers had the opportunity to thrive in isolation. There he collected arcane knowledge of sorcery from various human cultures. From them, he compiled a monumental volume on magic and psychic practices known as the Book of Magnus. Its shimmering binding was made from the hide of a slain Psychnoian. The Primarch carried it with him, fastened to his armour with a heavy gold chain, and it filled as he found new knowledge. The farther the fleets travelled from terror, the more strange creatures they encountered. Many of them were affected by the warp, and that cast an ominous shadow of suspicion on Magnus and the Thousand Sons for their magical abilities were very similar to the skills displayed by these evil creatures. As a result, distrust of Magnus began to grow after the joint actions of the Thousand Sons with the other legions. There were rumours that the Thousand Sons were transporting entire libraries on their ships to eventually place them in the Prosperian archives. In addition, Magnus's relations with even those brothers who had initially treated him well began to deteriorate. For example, the Thousand Sons responded to a call for help from the planet Morgenstern. They were later joined by the Iron Warriors. 
They tried to evacuate the population, for the abnormally rapid change of magnetic poles was causing tectonic shifts and threatened the entire population of the planet with extinction. On the surface, the space marines were opposed by the cult of the Sons of Shaitan, whose influence affected almost the entire population of the planet. Some communities reacted negatively to the rescue attempts and claimed that everything that was happening was a test. And after the end, the entire population of the planet would ascend as sun. Magnus and Perturabo acted together like brothers who had been friends since the cradle, even though they had known each other for only a few short years. It was obvious that the bonds of this friendship would never dissolve. The Legionnaires listened with pleasure to Magnus' stories of how he and his kinsmen had spent their time on Terra, searching for the legacy of a long-dead polymath and unearthing mysterious artifacts in forgotten corners of old Earth. During one of their audiences, Perturabo showed Magnus a model of the Antikythera, a navigational instrument similar to a sextant for traveling the great ocean. It was strange to Magnus to see such an elegant device in the hands of Perturabo. But the next moment he smashed it with his hammer. Perturabo explained his action by his unwillingness to help Cyclops with what the Emperor of Mankind had forbidden him to touch. Such an eloquent move should have said more than if his brother had simply refused to complete Antikythera's project. Magnus, however, did not heed his warning. A colonial spaceship, built before the Long Night, was discovered beneath one of the cities. Inside, Cyclops found a device that had been used to siphon power from the Psychers long ago. Their torment was so intense that the tormented souls formed a gestalt entity named Shaitan. To defeat it, the Primarch placed himself in this entity and saw the torment of all the tormented souls. He opened his consciousness to Shaitan, and the latter saw the reason for such inhumane acts of the past. Mankind had evolved too fast. Suddenly there were many carriers of the psychogene, and disaster was inevitable. The general insanity began with the psionics and struck the rest of the planet, plunging it into an abyss of destruction and death. Thus, the long night descended upon the galaxy one day. What went on on that ship was monstrously vile and immoral. But it kept Morgenstern safe from the horrors of the long night, for there were no psychers on the planet. The agony and fear of losing his abilities gave Magnus strength. He fought the mighty Shaitan and managed to defeat him. In the end, the Primarch won and imprisoned the entity in his book, not for the purpose of captivity, but for the purpose of salvation, so that the tormented souls of the psychers could find peace. However, he showed no such mercy to the planet's population, realizing that Shaitan's influence had spread to almost everyone, and they would rather die waiting for ascension than allow themselves to be saved, Magnus subjected the planet to exterminators. And then the evacuation fleet was shot into orbit as well. There was no other course of action, for the seeds of the apocalyptic cult of Shaitan could germinate elsewhere. At that moment, Magnus saw in Perturabo the first rusty spots of distrust. This was almost at the very beginning of the Great Crusade. It's hard to say whether Magnus the Red drew any conclusions for himself, but he certainly received unequivocal warnings about the dangers of the warp. The Great Crusade pressed onward. While the other space marine legions brought worlds to Concord, Magnus the Red turned his attention to worlds that seemed unusual to him. For instance, on a world such as Agoru, the currents of the warp softly brushed against its surface. The planet would have been a perfect sphere, immaculate in its structure, were it not for the mountain that punctuated the flow of the great ocean. The planet was inhabited by a primitive human civilization that preserved ancient legends of a race of elder beings they referred to as the Old Ones. Apparently, the natives called the Eldar race by this name. According to their mythology, most of the Old Ones perished, but among the survivors were creatures distorted by an unknown force called the Diastai. They were as fierce as they had been beautiful before. The Elohim fought the Diastai and drove them into the dungeon beneath the world. They did not have the strength to completely destroy their enemies, but they erected a mountain, thus closing the dungeon. Then they placed giant guards at the entrance. The Diastai remained underground, but their thirst for killing is unquenchable. 
And so every year, the people of Agoru bring their dead there to keep the Dayasthai slumbering. This hillock has become known tacitly as the man-eating mountain. Magnus was interested in this structure because of its size and the presence of ritual amulets at the foot, each of which exceeded the height of three people. These dead stones served as a tool to blunt the psychic forces surrounding the artificial summit. The captain of the Sixth Fellowship of the Thousand Suns accidentally awakened the mysterious power when he touched one of the Titan Guardians. The awakened Guardians attacked the uninvited guests and were defeated by the combined forces of the Thousand Suns and Space Wolves. Magnus reached inside the mountain and fought the evil that lurked in the heart of the world, then cast spells on the rift through which the warp energy seeped. But there he touched the knowledge that he had been waiting for on Aguru. He sensed the billions of paths diverging from that place, and the infinite possibility of a universe bound by a web of conceptual conduits, threading the space between worlds. The vast expanse of the galaxy shone with golden threads that bound it together as stone-paved roads had once bound the Roman Empire together. Even a gifted creature like Magnus couldn't memorize the entire labyrinth, but the moment he'd made contact behind the Wall of Darkness, he'd memorized millions of roads and access points. He couldn't see the entire web in an instant, but what he saw was enough to find other entrances and exits. He had discovered the Eldar web, and planned to present it to the Emperor in the future, not realizing that his father already knew much more about it. After the battle, Magnus explained that the creatures they had encountered were actually demons, some of the most dangerous inhabitants of the Great Ocean. This information worried the Space Wolves, who were working with the Thousand Suns. Later on the planet, Shrike Magnus met with Lehman Russ, before storming Raven's Fortress. Their brief exchange of insults at first horrified Ahriman, but then he realized that the brothers were bantering with each other in this way. He noticed, however, that there was not a hint of warmth in the brotherly handshake, and that the Primarch's phrases hid barbs that neither of them wished to reveal ahead of time. There was no doubt that tension was growing between the legions, and such contradictory formations as the Thousand Suns and the Space Wolves could be bitter enemies if they were on opposite sides of some military conflict. Several incidents occurred during the assault, during which the wolves fought a battle with the Sons of Magnus. And then, one of the legionnaires of the Thousand Sons began to have a flesh change. The formless monster stretched out its multi-jointed hands toward Magnus, who prepared to grant it peace. But the next moment, the monster's body was pierced by a projectile from Lehman Russ. The wolves spilled the blood of the son of Magnus right in front of Cyclops' eyes. The two Primarchs immediately rushed at each other, and the battle would have been overly bloody had it not been for the intervention of Lorgar, Primarch of the Word Bearers. There, on the surface of Shrike, Magnus's loud accusations of sorcery rang out. Lemon Russ heard his wolves use the same power as the Thousand Sons, but laughed in response. Lorgar managed to calm their fury with his eloquence, but as he left, the wolf slashed his palm with his blade and promised to avenge the blood of the sons of Fenris. It was a grim warning of things to come. Time passed. Along with the hatred of mutants and psychers in the other legions, there was a growing dislike of Magnus and the Thousand Sons. There were recorded instances of Primarchs expressing displeasure that an entire Psyker Legion was allowed to exist and serve the Great Crusade. There have even been suggestions that the Legion be disbanded, as was the case with the 2nd and 11th. After much debate over the use of Psykers, the Emperor convened a conclave on the remote planet of Nikea, where representatives of all the Legions arrived. The Space Wolves were the main opponents of the use of Psykers, for they shared their Primarch's hatred of sorcery. At the Council, in place of Lehman Russ, it was Other Weirdmake, often referred to as the Fate Weaver among some translations, who levelled accusations against the 15th Legion, the Thousand Sons. He charged them with the practices of sorcery, witchcraft, and the employment of forbidden magics. His accusations were supported by Primarch Mortarion of the Death Guard, recounting a number of companies where they had witnessed the horrors of sorcery. 
He also recalled that there were no librarians in his legion, for he had disliked them since his youth on Barbarus. As Magnus listened to the accusations, there was an inner struggle between rage and the need to justify himself between a raging instinct and a higher intellect. He wished to fall upon his brothers, who, in their own limited way, had stigmatized him. But reason, capable of ascending into the warp and casting a glance from the outside, restrained that desire and condemned base emotion. When it was the Crimson King's turn to keep his word, he was calm. In his speech, he compared the current views of the Psychers to those of the scientists of Old Earth, who tried to convince everyone that the planet was not flat. Then he talked about the Imperium of the future, envisioning it as an ideal state of progress and enlightenment, where scientists, philosophers and warriors participate equally in creating a brilliant future. He invited us to imagine what the people of this beautiful age would think as they gaze through the veil of time into the present day. What they would learn about and what conclusions they would draw. They would realize with horror how close to extinction the torch of enlightenment was that day. The art of questioning everything is the source of all knowledge. To abandon it is to condemn ourselves to a slow decline, to condemn the Imperium to the darkness of ignorance where people who dare to seek knowledge are viewed with suspicion. This was not the Imperium Magnus believed in, nor was it the Imperium he wanted to be a part of. Then Magnus told a parable about the dangers of sharing knowledge with those who have too narrow a view of reality. He spoke of a people who lived in a cave, whose food was scanty vegetation and water dripping from the rocks, and whose only source of light was a small fire. But one day the wind blew, and one of the cave dwellers decided to find out where it was blowing from. When the man came out of his lair, he saw a beautiful world with bright warm sunshine and rich vegetation, and he looked at the cave as a prison. When he learned about the existence of such a beautiful new world, he had the idea to show it to his friends. But they called him crazy and did not want to leave the limited reality. So he climbed the mountain and started digging until he reached the cave. When the light of the sun illuminated the cave vaults, his friends rejoiced and went with him into a beautiful new world. The audience was enchanted by his story, but Ahriman knew that the Primarch had deliberately changed the ending, for in the original version of the legend, the friends were so frightened by the scene that they killed the man and retreated deep into the cave, taking the fire with them to continue their life in the eternal gloom. Magnus's speech impressed many, and some of the brothers were ready to take his side. But the Emperor gave the final verdict, setting the record straight. Now listen to my decision, the Emperor spoke, and a multitude of feathers squeaked in the amphitheatre. I cannot help but see the needs of the Imperium, but I cannot help but see the real state of people's souls. I have heard knowledge compared to abstract concepts, how it is claimed to be as easy to operate as a sword or a gun, but it isn't. Power is a living force. And the chief danger in the possession of power lies in obsession. A man who achieves a certain measure of might soon falls under its influence and can think of nothing else but reaching new limits. Almost every man is capable of resisting the vicissitudes of fate, but only a few are of sufficiently firm character to wield power and not succumb to its dark temptations. Looking into the darkness to gain knowledge from the warp is very dangerous, for it is a space of shifting reality and bizarre lies. The seeker of truth must be sure that he has not succumbed to delusion, for false knowledge is even more dangerous than ignorance. All people seek knowledge, but few are willing to pay for it. People will always seek shortcuts and easy ways to gain power, and it is not the enemy that draws them to the path of evil, but their own thoughts. True knowledge comes only with the attainment of wisdom. Without wisdom, a man who has power will never gain power, but will become careless. His power will turn against his master and eventually destroy everything he has built. I have travelled paths beyond the reach of any man, and I have faced the spawn of the warp that cannot be named aloud. I know all too well the dangers and secrets of the darkness, and these trials are not for the faint of heart, however knowledgeable and powerful they may think themselves to be. And I've managed to uncover some secrets, but as a warning, not a temptation for further exploration. And those who go too far in pursuit of secrets not meant for mortals will only face doom and eternal torment. 
I see now that I have in vain allowed my sons to plunge into depths of which it would have been better for them not to have known. All must realize that no judgment will be passed, for the conclave was assembled for the sake of unity, not for the sake of strife. But the temptations of sorcery must no longer tempt any of the Astartes. From this moment forward, I command that all librarians be dissolved. All warriors and instructors are to return to their battle companies and never use psychic powers again. Woe to him who dares to ignore the ban or tries to deceive me. He will be my enemy, and on his head and the heads of his followers will fall such a punishment that to the end of the world they will curse the day they turned away from my light. The thunderous words of the Emperor of Mankind were nothing short of a sentence for Magnus and the Thousand Sons. They were forbidden to practice sorcery and seek the knowledge they craved. Disappointed and dissatisfied with this decision, the Crimson King was forced to accept the new ban, but soon tried to find a rational explanation to get around them. He foresaw the ruinous powers crafting a malevolent scheme around the Warmaster, Horus, and sought to warn him. By projecting his psychic essence into Horus's dreams, he aimed to alert his brother to the impending danger. However, he was oblivious to the corruption already festering within Horus, and the critical role the word-bearers would play in the unfolding tragedy. When Magnus appeared in his visions, he saw Erebus there, pushing the already falling Horus into the embrace of chaos. Cyclops failed to dissuade his brother, and then, despairing, he decided to use the power of his legion's greatest mages to deliver news of the impending civil war to the Emperor himself on Terra. It was unwise to use the standard means of astro-telepathy, for it would take a long time to transmit the message. When everything was ready, his astral body separated from his material shell and floated upward. Magnus laughed happily, welcoming the familiar energy waves and currents that embraced him like a long-absent friend. He was a bright star, and the others were shimmering bits of amber compared to his divine radiance. In the great ocean, he could be anything. Here there were no inhibitions, and anything was possible. He rushed through the surging shafts of colour, light and nameless dimensions, and worlds floated past him. He hurried toward his goal like the most incredible comet that had ever flown among the stars, and even the predators tried to get out of his way. They recognised him, and in a realm where the light of creation burned in every breath, his dazzling radiance struck fear into their hearts. New philosophies and lines of thought were born in the minds of mortals who were fortunate enough to be near his root. Finally, he found a fragment of the web and attempted to break in with silver lightning. This act took the lives of dozens of Psyker thralls on Prospero, who had fueled him during the ritual. Then he rained down mighty fists upon the wall. But with each blow, a dozen thralls perished. Magnus felt his strength draining away. In the next moment he was enveloped in streams of warm light, and a bright psychic entity appeared before him, offering help and infusing the Cyclops with its power. Magnus believed that both evil and good beings existed in the great ocean, and that they could be interacted with to varying degrees. There was no doubt that the entity before him was not a tainted entity that could enlighten not only him, but all of humanity. The Primarch accepted the help not realizing how wrong he was. The wall parted, letting out a shrill groan that sounded like a cry of pain. He determined the route to terror and rushed forward. A short time later, the golden portal beneath the Emperor's palace flared with its own internal light, as if the metal on the other side was glowing hot from an invisible torch. The huge automatic guns mounted around the perimeter of the hall raised their barrels and switched to combat mode. Some circuits overloaded, and miniature lightning bolts began to leap between the machines. The adepts rushed away from the door. They didn't know what was behind it, but they were smart enough to prefer fleeing. Crackling energy discharges erupted from the molten metal and incinerated those who had not escaped. The symbols carved into the stone exploded with sharp pops. Finally, all the lights in the hall went out, and the results of centuries of work were irrevocably destroyed. The Emperor's custodians grabbed their weapons, but no amount of training could have prepared them for what happened next. A massive red figure appeared in the doorway, engulfed in flames, 
It burst into the hall, scattering tongues of fire. The creature, composed of moving streams of light and stellar matter, spread a glow that blinded everyone around it. And at the sight of its many eyes, no one could shake off the consciousness of his own mortality. No one had ever seen such a horrible vision, and the real heart of this creature was so powerful that it beat only in specially created flesh. The Emperor alone recognized the magnificent angel, and when he did, he was greatly saddened. Their thoughts met, and in that moment of close contact, the galaxy changed forever. A silent conversation took place between the Emperor and Magnus. Everything Magnus had done was revealed, and everything the Emperor had planned was revealed. The Primarch saw himself sitting on the Golden Throne, using its incredible power to guide humanity to dominate the entire galaxy. He was to be his father's chosen instrument to achieve ultimate victory. And he was intolerably pained that his thoughtless arrogance had shattered that dream. Magnus believed he had surpassed his father in subduing the forces of the Great Ocean. He believed he had learned to control its power, but in the ruins of his father's greatest work, he realized the truth. The key to everything was the Golden Throne. Extracted from the buried ruins from the depths of the barren desert itself, it had been the natural magnet that could unlock the mystery of the warp currents and cast a net over them. Now all that was left of it was rubble, and its incredibly complex stabilizers and warp dampers had melted into a homogeneous mass. Magnus's astral body rushed toward the gap he had made in the web, where countless hordes of warp creatures had already gathered, subsisting solely on destruction. He raced through the timeless depths of the great ocean and awoke in the reflecting caves at the center of the abode of the dead. There were no thralls left alive, and even their bodies had been desiccated to a decrepit shell by his spell. He was met only by Ahriman, but even he looked haggard beyond repair. With tears in his eyes, Magnus rushed away from the scene of his crime and sprinted to the Pyramid of Fotep, ignoring Ahriman's questions. Alone, amidst the deceptive results of centuries of research, his vision became clouded with a bloody veil. The pristine Tizka seemed to live its life unaware of the catastrophe Magnus had brought upon the planet. Magnus, the Red's actions have created a demon-infested area in the Imperium's domain of the web, which has come to be known as Magnus's Madness. The Legio Custodes, Adeptus Mechanicus, and a wide variety of military personnel were drawn into a grueling war, and the Emperor took the Golden Throne to contain the influx of warp essence. He was furious at his son's willful violation of his son's prohibitions on the use of magic. His actions had damaged a secret project, centuries in the making, to use the construct to create roots around the warp. The Emperor then instructed Lim and Russ Primarch of the Space Wolves, to bring Magnus quickly to Terra to account for his actions. It is hard to say whether the Emperor learned of Horus from Magnus's mind and knew of Lehman Russ's animosity, but what happened next forever shackled the Emperor to the throne and changed the face of the galaxy. On his way to Prospero, the War Master contacted the Wolf Lord and made some adjustments to the Order. He convinced his brother that the Crimson King wished to destroy their father and that his appearance on Terra would have fatal consequences. Magnus must not be allowed near the Emperor and must be destroyed. Magnus the Red was in his chambers in total confusion. He realized too late that his vanity had prevented him from heeding his father's warnings, that he had been mistaken in thinking he controlled forces beyond his control. And he realized too late that he'd fallen into a trap. That's the price of all mistakes, realizing them too late. Only now did he realize that he should stop staring into the abyss of warp as the Emperor had warned, but it was too late, for the abyss was already staring back at him. Magnus was addressed by an entity from the cracked mirror. It spoke of his exceptional role in the events to come, that he had a better destiny than to rot on the Golden Throne guiding ships across the galaxy. And then he went back for a moment to the days when he had first taken command of the Legion, to find a cure for the flesh change. Magnus stepped into the warp and fought the demon Coronzon, who appeared in the form of a giant serpent. The Primarch was victorious and plucked the knowledge from the warp.
The second time he met him was on Agoru when he was sealing the breach. And then the serpent said that Cyclops had already drunk from the poisonous cup and it was time to pay the bill. However, he grabbed the serpent and strangled it. But now it was clear that he had only been allowed to think as if he had won. For before him was a consciousness far more powerful than an ordinary demon. Such entities were called nothing less than God by mortals in their meager language. Blinded by his own pride and his desire to save his sons, the Primarch did not realize that he had made a bargain not with Corazon, the demon of dispersion, but with the Lord of Change himself. His legion had only received a reprieve, for now the bargain was coming to an end, and one of the truths of Empirius was coming for Magnus and his sons. The Cyclops resisted, but Zinch voiced his future fate and offered to see it for himself if the Primarch did not believe his words. In desperation, Magnus looked into the warp and saw his destiny coming to him in the form of wolves stalking among the stars. When the first bombs fell on Prospero, Ahriman was horrified to find that the orbital fleet was scattered, the defences were down and the shields were down, and only the cane shield over the city was doing its job, for it was supported by the Thousand Sons through their efforts. The legionnaires turned to their Primarch for answers, and then he told them all that had happened. The bargain with a powerful deity older than time itself, the price for salvation from the flesh change, the fact that their Primarch had been a puppet all along, and that the Thousand Sons must accept their fate and be destroyed. Magnus the Red was unwilling to betray his father and in desperation decided to take his punishment in full and surrender. But his legionaries refused to surrender and Prospero was engulfed in flames. The Thousand Sons put up a decent resistance from the start. At one point, the advantage was completely on their side. But then the Null Divas entered the fray, and the psycho deprived warriors began to lose. Soon the punitive army reached the City of Light. Magnus watched Tiska's demise from the topmost balcony of his pyramid. There was no reflective surface left inside his chambers, no opportunity for the persistent temptation that called for another mistake. He clutched the balcony railing with his fingers and wept bitter tears for his lost world and his dying sons. The Primarch longed to support his sons, but he did not want to make the last mistake of his life and went mad, trying to push the voices of the legionnaires, calling out to him out of his head. Soon he was overcome by his unwillingness to accept what was happening. When Ahriman's line of defense at the Pyramid of Fotep became the last frontier, the Primarch made a choice to stand against the punitive army. When he appeared on the battlefield, the sky became a transparent window to other realms. The doomed world was stared at by bulging eyes the size of mountains and formless creatures, the likes of which no madman could see in a delirium. Hundreds of warriors died in the same instant from this blasphemous horror. Magnus fought Rust to the death. Their blows were as loud as planets colliding. Both men's armor broke, lightning crackled around them. Weapons were covered in frost, the ground cracked, and bodies of water turned to acid. In the end, Cyclops was defeated. Lehman Russ threw his brother to his raised knee, and the crack of the Crimson King's spine-breaking echoed in the hearts of every one of the Thousand Sons. At the last moment, Magnus cast a spell and carried the entire Legion into the warp. And so the Thousand Sons found a new home on the planet of the Witchfinders. Since then, their situation had worsened, for flesh rebirths had become more frequent, and the Legion's numbers had fallen back to a thousand. Then earthquakes ripped the surface of the planet and the ugly obsidian tower rose to the sky, Magnus standing atop it, wings spread. It was not all that clear-cut, however, for Lehman Russ had not merely defeated the Primarch, but had split his essence into many shards that scattered across the waves of warp. It was hard to say whether these shards felt themselves to be one and only, or whether they realized that the dweller atop the obsidian tower was the base from which they had all broken away. Ahriman was tasked with finding the shards to save his genetic father, and he, gathering like-minded people, set out to find them. However, not all of them were found and returned. For example, the remaining shard on Prospero was destroyed by Jagatai Khan before telling the Primarch of the White Scars what had happened on the planet. One of the shards of Magnus the Red 
was located in a hidden repository on Sorcerer's Planet, secured within the ceremonial urn of a notable Psyker scholar of the Thousand Suns. This scholar had foreseen the Space Wolves' assault on Prospero, contributing significantly to the Legion's preparations. After their demise, the scholar's remains were safeguarded by a loyal sorcerer of the Thousand Suns present on the planet at that time. Another fragment of Magnus the Red's essence was located atop a perilous peak within the planet of the sorcerers, embodying the martial prowess of the Crimson King. This fragment was first encountered by the agents of the Sigilite, seeking to secure it for the Imperium, yet they were unable to overcome its guardians. Ultimately, this fragment was bound within a Sorcerer of the Thousand Suns, held in stasis until such time as Azek Ahriman, the Legion's chief sorcerer, would seek to recover it. For one of his shards, Ahriman had to travel into Terra's past to find King Cadmus, ruler of the Kingdom of Boeotia. The king contained a vast library of lost knowledge, mostly concerning ancient Greece. King Cadmus was eventually defeated in the Boeotian conflict, but years later, a shard of Magnus representing the quest for lost knowledge settled in his body, travelling back in time. Ironically, upon entering Cadmus's chambers, Ahriman met a civilian who introduced himself as Caspar Hauser. The librarian grinned, thinking it was a joke, for he recognised the reference to the so-called Child of Europa from an old Terran legend, through whom Lehman Russ would try to contact Magnus and inform him of Prospero's imminent burning. And another shard was found on Nikea, that represented Magnus's bitterness at being betrayed by the Emperor and the Imperium, which was awakened after the monstrous judgment on that planet. While Ahriman searched for the shards, Magnus was slowly consumed by madness. He tried his best to recover his lost knowledge and began to write down everything he knew. He was surrounded by less powerful shards who were diligently recording the information in folios. But sometimes terrible things happened. They began to disappear, the identity of the Crimson King crumbled and crumbled, and his ashes were carried away by the winds of the warp. More than once, Magnus was visited by Primarch Lorgar, whom he first mistook for a ghost and threw out of his tower. Another time, he already knew who was before him. His brother had tried to persuade him to join Horus. Sometimes he appeared to Lorgar in astral form when Eurizen was preparing to attack Ultramar. But at that moment, the Crimson King had not yet decided to join the warrior. When Ahriman returned to the planet of the Witchfinders, he saw a withered and aged Primarch. But after reuniting with the Lost Shards, he was reborn. It was the majestic and formidable Crimson King, who in his address to his son said that they would side with the warrior and that he would not rest until they had stormed the castle to retrieve the greatest shard that was locked in the Dungeons of Terror. Magnus's noble traits were embodied in that shard, and it roamed the dungeons of the Imperial Palace until Malkador the Sigilit sealed it in the body of Royal Arvid. Magnus eventually appeared in the material world on Ulanor, and knelt before the warrior. In the early stages of the Siege of Terror, he appeared at a war council of traitors aboard the Vengeful Spirit, giving advice on disabling the Emperor's psychic barrier that prevented demons from appearing on Terra. After the fall of the Lion's Gate spaceport, rumours spread that Magnus had finally been summoned to the battlefield, and Malkador believed he was using his psychic power to weaken the Emperor. During a raid on the moon to capture Magna Mater by the Loyalist ship Sisyphus, the Crimson King ordered the Loyalists to assist in their escape. During the assault on the Colossus Gate, Cyclops met his fallen brother, Mortarion. Sympathizing with the constant pain the latter was experiencing, Magnus the Red taught him how to better control his powers to regain his former composure. In truth, Magnus simply did this in order to manipulate Mortarion into launching an attack to cover his own infiltration of the Imperial Dungeon. Later, when the attack by the Thousand Suns and the Death Guard on the Colossus Gate failed, Magnus said that the operation was not a complete failure, for he got what he wanted. Shortly after the defeat of the Renegades at Saturn's Wall, Cyclops made his move, gathering the Thousand Suns on Terra to attack the Palace region in the Western Hemisphere. After breaking through, 
He entered the battle in person, but was opposed by Bodvar Bjarki and his wolves. However, this was merely a ruse to infiltrate the sanctuary with Ahriman. Mentally masquerading as loyalists, Cyclops and his retinue made their way through the Great Observatory, where the Crimson King unexpectedly saved a group of refugees from Phosphex bombs. After penetrating deep beneath the palace through Lenga Hall, Magnus and his sons appeared before Malkador and Olivia Sureka on the shores of a vast underground lake. Malkador offered Magnus a game of regicide with Sureka, and it soon became apparent that he was trying to win the Crimson King over to his side. As they travelled deeper into the Imperial Dungeon, Magnus and his entourage next encountered a projection of the Emperor that led them to the throne room. There Magnus stood before his father, who sat on the Golden Throne. Determined to fulfil his vow to kill the Emperor, the Crimson King destroyed the projection and activated his staff to deliver the killing blow. But before he could follow through, Vulcan blocked his path. The eyes of the Emperor of Mankind suddenly opened, and Magnus found himself floating on the ether with his father, watching the rise and fall of the galaxy. The Emperor showed a future in which the Primarchs had never opposed the Imperium, and the last peace in the galaxy had been won in the name of humanity. In that future, Magnus sat on the Golden Throne and ruled the Imperial Web, and his soul was in eternal bliss, drifting in the Immaterium with the Emperor and discovering the frontiers of cosmic knowledge. His father declared that such a future was not yet lost and Magnus could return to the Loyalist side at the head of the new legion being prepared for him. Together, they would expel the traitors from terror and accomplish the Great Purge. The price was high, however, for the Emperor had declared the Thousand Sons damned because of the rampant flesh alteration, exactly the same price Magnus the Red could have paid when Lehman Russ burned his planet, but he had not, for no father would wish his children dead. And now the Emperor was offering his son to pay that price again. The Thousand Sons could not follow Magnus back into the Emperor's arms. They had to be purged. The price was too high, so he struck at the Emperor again but found himself in battle with Vulcan. During the battle, Magnus almost defeated the Salamander Primarch, but the sacrifice of Barak Zytos allowed Vulcan to apparently force the Crimson King into submission. Before Vulcan could deliver the final blow, Magnus gave himself over completely to the forces of chaos, taking on a new etheric form, and was banished by the psychic warders of the Imperial Dungeon along with his sons. Magnus, son of the Emperor, died. The Demon Prince of Change was born. The next time he appeared, he was already a winged avatar of Tzinch, whose legs ended in split hooves. He travelled to the Imperial Web, performing a psychic ritual and attempting to strip the Emperor of his remaining powers so that demons could manifest even within the Sanctum Imperialis itself. Malkador sent Vulcan to finish off his brother when the Gates of Eternity themselves were besieged. After travelling to the Impossible City in the Spider's Web, Vulcan finally appeared before Magnus. Again, ignoring his brother's manipulations, including the vision of Prospero burning, they went into battle. At the beginning of the battle, it seemed to Vulcan that he was attacking Smoke, for the real Magnus was behind the barrier, immersed in ritual. The Lord of Nocturne took advantage of this and provoked his enemy to attempt a direct kill. Unaware of Vulcan's immortality, Cyclops used all available methods, decapitated him, strangled him by turning his lungs into amber, sucked his blood and burned him. But each time the Eternal Vulcan revived and attacked Magnus. Exhaustion took over, and Magnus fell into increasing despair. He entered Vulcan's mind, trying to explain his actions. But the Primarch only berated him for his arrogant and reckless use of the magic that had turned him into a slave to chaos. Bringing his hammer in for a final blow, Vulcan swayed, and Magnus managed to use a spell to destroy his brother on a genetic level. Before the Salamander's body crumbled, he was able to smash Cyclops' head with his hammer and send him into warp. After the Emperor defeated Horus, legions of traitors fled Terror. The Thousand Suns returned to the planet of the Witchfinders in the Eye of Terror, which had become a chaotic reflection of their homeworld. Zinch had one more gift for the Thousand Suns, namely the complete return of their aberrant genetic mutations that threatened to turn all surviving space marines into mindless chaos brats. 
Several high-ranking officers of the Legion, led by Azek Ahriman, formed a secret clique to find ways to stop the flesh alteration. They eventually used a powerful spell that had the opposite effect, killing all those Legion Astartes who lacked psychic abilities and turning them into living automatons. Their organic bodies turned to ash, while their unsuspecting souls were trapped inside the power armor. Every joint of the armor was magically sealed, and the only way for a soul to break out of this prison was destruction. The minority of Astartes from the Thousand Suns who did not succumb to the spell later known as the Rubric of Ahriman, found their psychic abilities multiplied. The ritual also achieved its purpose as mutations ceased in both survivors and undead brethren. In fury, Magnus attacked Ahriman and his clique, but was unable to kill him. For at the last moment, the Architect of Fates personally stopped the Crimson King's hand, for Ahriman was a useful tool for advancing Zinch's far-reaching plans in the material dimension. Magnus banished Ahriman and his remaining companions from the Witch Planet and ordered them to wander the galaxy forever in search of understanding and knowledge of the true nature of chaos. Magnus realized that everything that had happened had been planned by the Way Changer and that he had no power to prevent it. For the Legion for which he had done so much was now reduced to ashes-filled golems. The demon Primarch climbed to the top of his tower and swore that the entire galaxy would burn as Horus once did. Since then, he has waged his war against the father who once betrayed him. He was once a paragon of humanity, but the last vestiges of it dissipated in the Emperor's palace when his father proposed the destruction of the Thousand Suns. Now Magnus is a monstrous creature of chaos, subject to the sinister and sophisticated will of Tzinch, the great conspirator. His skin is always red, crackling and glowing from absorbed warp matter, and from his back protrude huge wings adorned with the writhing runes of Zinch. With his single eye, he sees through both immaterium and real space, weaving threads of the manifold future and winding them to form a loop with which he can trap his enemies. Once he sought knowledge for its own sake, now he seeks only that which will allow the Imperium to burn for its crimes against him. In a galaxy torn by war, few things are more terrifying on a battlefield than a demon Primarch. Where Magnus steps, the fabric of reality thins and tears, time and space violently sliding apart to allow him to pass. His very sight burns the mind with shifting paradoxical images and glimpses of warp incomprehensible to mortal thought. Those upon whom Magnus's shadow falls are immediately plunged into impenetrable darkness, and their minds curl into a dense singularity as the demonic presence of the Crimson King invades their psyche. Even fearless warriors who have endured countless terrible conflicts find their courage shattered when the Lord of the Thousand Suns goes on a rampage. Magnus's blazing eye emits blasts of raw psychic energy. With each crushing blow, titans and armoured columns are ripped from reality, their very essence transformed into clouds of screaming atoms. As the demon Primarch approaches his foes, they are caught in a field of fluctuating energy, an aura of malicious consciousness that warps all things in accordance with Magnus's will. This influence exposes the most impenetrable defences, leaving the enemy open to destruction. His horned garb has undergone a change. The plate armour is now adorned with writings in a dark tongue. Their unholy symbolism creates a tapestry of madness. Anunura's blade is now known as the Blade of Magnus. He uses it to cut through enemy ranks, slicing tank hulls and torsos in half, separating souls from their material bodies. Those who are not instantly transformed into pools of blood or clouds of flame suffer an even worse fate. The enchanted sword alters the torn flesh of its victims, infusing them with empirical power, creating writhing spawns of chaos. Above his horns shines the crown of the Crimson King a halo of psychic power that shields his mind and body from harm while protecting his physical mental self. The futility of confronting Magnus's anger becomes apparent when the enemy fire dissipates without causing harm. The mental discharges turn into harmless sparks, and the giant chain swords grind to a halt in front of that etheric barrier. Sometime later, in the 41st millennium, Ahriman attempted to create a second rubric on the Sorcerer Planet, 
but a rival clique of Thousand Suns mages discovered that the rubric would lead to the destruction of Magnus, and the Primarch eventually used the ritual to assimilate with more lost shards of himself. He became almost whole, but the shards that were lost were those that embodied his noblest qualities. The demon Primarch appeared in the material world in the last years of the 41st millennium and attacked the homeworld of the Space Wolves. He had been preparing for the invasion for centuries, sowing Wolfen corruption throughout the Order, corrupting the Gene Seed at the Battle of Fang, and using the Shifter to provoke an Imperial attack. Magnus's invasion was eventually stopped, and he was banished back to the Warp by Logan Grimnar, wielder of the Axe of Morkai. But that in turn no longer mattered, as he succeeded in his ultimate goal. By sacrificing of the planet Midgardia, Magnus moved the planet of the sorcerers into the material world. The Crimson King reappeared at the head of the Thousand Suns in a massive ship resembling the Pyramid of Tizka and organized a ritual that prevented the expedition of Primarch Robout Gilliman from reaching terror and trapped him in Maelstrom. Gilliman managed to escape the trap, but Magnus saw it coming. He met his brother inside the web. His plan was to trick Gilliman's allies into opening a portal to terror, allowing his own forces to enter. However, the Lord of Ultramar had figured out Magnus and headed for the moon. Magnus and Gilliman engaged in battle. Cyclops had the upper hand until the Sisters of Silence arrived from terror, weakening Magnus so much that Gilliman stabbed him in the chest. The Crimson King was forced to retreat with the Thousand Sons. Magnus later appeared at the head of a huge Tsinch army during the invasion of the Stygius Sector. They managed to capture many worlds that the Primarch Mortarion had previously appropriated and turned into the stars of the Stygius. Loyalist forces were sent there to retake the Stygius Sector, but it failed even with the help of the Eldar from the world ship Ulthwe. The Sector was the first of the domains Tsinch planned to claim. Magnus soon returned to Prospero, intending to use the newly discovered portals to summon an army of demons. However, his plans were thwarted by the Space Wolves. In the midst of the battle, the Crimson King was tricked by Lucas the Trapper, who offered him a necessary spell that was actually just a useless piece of paper. The trick allowed Lucas and the last remaining wolves to escape. Since the opening of the Great Rift, Magnus has succeeded where the Emperor failed and elevated humanity to a truly psychic race. Radiating a magical aura from the recently relocated Prospero, he attempted to create a fulcrum for Zinch in the material dimension. But his plans were thwarted by the Imperium's sudden attack on the planet Sortiarius. The current location of the Crimson King is unknown, but one thing is certain, he appears wherever the Architect of Fates intends to take over another dominion in the material universe. He leads powerful armies of demons and chaos space marines. He is the architect of nightmarish rituals that can affect entire star systems. To conclude the story of the most powerful Primarch, we must return to the question, did Magnus betray or was he betrayed? There is no doubt that the Crimson King was a victim of his own pride, for he mistakenly believed that he controlled forces that could not be controlled. His irresistible desire to do good and bring mankind to the apotheosis of knowledge did not give him a moment to doubt, to stop and think. It is said that when the gods want to test a man, they throw his strongest qualities against him. That's what happened to Magnus, and it was a test he failed. So did Magnus betray? Yes, but not right away.